Is this on? It sounds in- incredibly, incredibly deep. Yeah, maybe we should uh, turn the podcast into an ASMR podcast or something. <laughs> now that we've upgraded Just our sent 12 mic, people to the hospital, mic technology. <laughs> yes, you are. You are hearing the the voices of two incredibly good sounding presenters through two new upgraded microphones. I don't know if we sound incredibly good, but we have got two incredibly good microphones. Our voices sound good, our, our you know, content of what we're saying, perhaps different. Uh, yeah, th- thanks for joining us, everyone, for the 37th episode of the Page One Podcast. I'm Marco. I'm Tarek. And if you're just joining us for the Page One Podcast for the first time, uh, at the Page One Podcast, we like to speak to writers of all kinds, uh, authors, screenwriters, comic book writers, video game writers, and more, uh, to try and learn about how they got into the industry, try and get hints and tips and learn about all the different writing processes that they each have. And I think it's fair to say that in all the guests that we've had, everyone is, you know, there's definitely some similarities and there's definitely some differences uh, across the different types of authors or writers, um, like David Baldacci, Sarah Pimbra, Tim Levin, Christopher Golden. There's, there's a good. Fair to say, no one's had the same route. I don't think. No, I think that's right. I think that's right. Um, and we've got another great author on this week, Tarek. We do indeed. This week we are chatting with Tendai Huchu, who is a Zimbabwean-born author, a uh, long-term resident in Edinburgh. He broke into the world with his uh, novel Hairdresser of Harare which uh, told, it was a story set in Zimbabwe and told a story through the eyes of a hairdresser, a contemporary story of what life is like over there. His follow-up novel, The uh, The Maestro, The Magistrate and The Mathematician, was a supposed spiritual successor, you might say. Zimbabweans who had moved to Edinburgh. um, and, and, And really, I think a lot of his writing is about people trying to find their place in, in, in the world, mm-hmm. um, perhaps similar to his own experiences of, of moving across, you know, across the world. And uh, a very popular author, uh, his first novel, The Hairdresser of Harare, was named as one of the top 10 contemporary African books of 2012 by The Observer. And it's also nominated for The Guardian's Not the Booker Prize Award, mm-hmm. which is very exciting. Yeah, we, we talked to him about all of that and how that, that all happened for him. And... Um, also have a really interesting chat with him about, you know, the, the representation of African voices in literature, um, which has definitely improved over over recent years, I think. But, you know, it, it is an interesting topic. Mm-hmm. We, we have had books written by quite famous authors uh, who aren't from Africa, about Africa, and we chat yeah. to him about that and, uh, you know, whether that's as valid a form as an authentic voice from Africa. Um, so it, it's a really interesting chat we had with him, I thought. Um, yeah, absolutely. So we won't keep you any longer and we'll just get straight into the podcast after a brief advert for our Page One Notebook, which is the writer's notebook that we've designed. And you can hear a bit more about that just now. On with the podcast. The blank page. To some, it's terrifying, an obstacle to overcome. But we prefer to think of it as an opportunity, a blank canvas to be filled with all of the adventures and characters in our head. So how to overcome that fear? Well, we all know the best advice for a writer is, write. Seriously, get words on the page and more will follow. But what about later, when you start trying to pull those threads of what you've written together? What about the character you wrote about way back at the start? Who was she again? What was she carrying? And where did she leave the MacGuffin that she now really needs in the third act? Think about all those top thrillers you like to read. Or that amazing drama you just watched. What did they all have in common? Structure and planning. As aspiring writers ourselves, we've tried many different methods to try and organise all the thoughts about the stories we want to tell. We've been there searching for a piece of scrap paper to note something down, or making a quick note on our phone in between meetings. Or sometimes we'll make a note in whatever notebook we're carrying or a document on our laptop so we don't forget that great idea. Let's be honest, it can all be a bit messy and it's easy to lose track of everything. And that's when we realise it's not just a story that needs structure and planning, but the way we gather all of our thoughts about it as well. And so we made page one. Page one is more than just another notebook. 
It's a place to put down all your ideas for your latest project, divided into easy to use sections that will help you plan your story so that when that blank page comes calling, you're ready to answer. And then afterwards, once it's written, we realized you need to plan how to let people read it, so we included a section relating to submissions. Each one is designed for one project. Whether you want to write a book, screenplay, a comic, or any other kind of story, we truly believe that when you use it, it will help you get to the main event, writing your story. So we hope this helps. We can't wait to read what you come up with. And remember, every story starts with page one. Did you always want to be a writer? Was that always an ambition? That's a very difficult question because <laughs> you never quite know where you start. I mean, I remember when I was in high school, I was part of, um, I went to Churchill Boys High School in Harare in Zimbabwe. And I was part of the school newspaper. There was a writer's um, writing club with one of my English teachers called Mr. Machakata. And we did a bit of work there, but it was all, all you know, juvenil juvenilia, mm -hmm. um, as you can imagine. Uh, and I had an interest. I, I remember when I was on my O-level holidays, I made my first stab at, at writing a novel, mm -hmm. which didn't quite work because I didn't know what I was doing. Uh, and, and, and after that, you know, there wasn't a lot of interest until I was in my early 20s when I took a stab at it. So I think the signs were there early on. Um, but, you know, the, the, the stars sort of have to align before you yeah. really get into it and, and you become a serious writer. I think everyone at some point wants to be a writer and they think they can do it. But yeah. it, it's only a precious few that go on to actually do the work. Mm -hmm. I think I think that's right. So I mean, what was it for you that that made you take that 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 step of saying, right, I'm actually going to try and do this properly? In my twenties, after I just like uh, moved to the UK from Zimbabwe, um, I lived in Reading, and you know, I was for the first time I had money to actually buy the books that I wanted to, as opposed to reading material that was available. You know, it's, it's a book here. It's, it's an hour's wages. It's it's not a lot of money to mm -hmm. buy a book. Whereas in Zimbabwe, it's a lot of you know it's it's, it's a big investment and, mm -hmm. and particularly for fiction. I mean, people buy textbooks and and academic works, but very few people buy and read fiction, obviously, because it just costs a lot of money. Um, and so in my early twenties, I got hooked on Dostoevsky and the Russians. And have you ever read something that speaks to you so directly? It's like, and I. A writer is expressing something that you felt or thought, but in such a vivid way, yeah. and you're like, "This is amazing." Mm -hmm. um, so I did what you do at that age. I plagiarized the story, <laughs> 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 and I, yeah, in, in, in a dire sort of like stab at at, at it. Like, um, so I wrote a book. Uh, you know, it was so badly done, and and. I'm so happy no one published it and no one saw any merit in it because it, it was dire. But that's how you start off with a bit of imitation and eventually you you get to a stage where you have some mastery of the craft and you also have a better sense of what your thing is. Yeah. But that's how I started, um, trial and error. And then, and then how did you actually make your first steps into that world once you knew that was what you wanted to do? Did you go down the agent path first? Or did you did you write the book? Oh, this is the crazy thing. So with that first manuscript, now, I didn't know anything at all about the writing world. So I read books and I, I didn't know any writers. I, you know, barely had access to the internet, except, you know, internet cafes were a thing then. Uh but I learned of something called the Writers and Artists Yearbook mm -hmm. that you could also buy from Waterstones. And it told you how to contact, you know, agents and publishers, etc. So I gave it a go. But to be honest, my work just wasn't there yet. And, you know, I, I got tons of rejection slips, some of which I, I do have. Uh, I recall one in particular where, you know, you've typed out your letter and you've sent it. And, and, those days, you used to um, send a self-addressed envelope, envelope yeah, yeah. and letter to get your response. And I get this thing back, and it was literally one line scribbled across my own letter, which just said, not for us. 
and they didn't even <laughs> sign it. It was <laughs> that was definitely That's absolutely crazy. shocking. <laughs> That is us. I mean, you would, you would rather not get anything back at all than get that back, I think. Exactly, because you just used to get, you know, your, your form rejections yeah. and that kind of thing. But that one, I will always remember. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, this world is brutal. But, I mean, I just kept working at it, kept plugging away because it's, I think there is something that has to compel you to want to do this. Yeah. Um, one thing that we don't talk about a lot as writers or artists in general is just how much failure you have to grind through. Mm -hmm. um, and even now, uh, where I've had a bit of um, success relatively, uh, but even now you still face the same battle. You face the white blank page and you create something and you have absolutely no idea whether it's going to sell or not. Mm -hmm. You have no idea whether it's, it's, it's any good or not. It's enough to make anyone neurotic. I, I really don't know why we do this. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm sure there's more sensible ways of, of sort of like, I don't know, occupying one's time, but something deep inside of us as, as writers just compels us to just keep plugging away. Well, I, um, I think that's it, isn't it? Because like you say, if you're, if you're, when you're faced with rejections and you're getting lots of rejections or you're not even hearing back from agents and things like that, it's not, it, it can be a blow to your, <laughs> your belief system about whether you can do this or not. And it's having that, maintaining that belief, I suppose, and, and pushing through it and saying, no, no, I have to do this. I have to write. I think that that keeps people. You know, that's a sort of another separating line from the people that first of all don't start writing at all, even though they think, "Oh, one day I'd like to do that." And then there's another line where people who have had rejection push through that and keep going. I think, and that's true. Um, and and there's two sort of like separate sides to this. There is the sheer joy that you get from actually doing the work. Mm -hmm. I, I know it's fashionable to be the tortured artist or writing is hard, et cetera, et cetera, but I absolutely love it. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm happiest when I'm just plugging away at my laptop, just creating these fictional characters. I mean, if you really want to do something hard, uh, get a job, get any job, work at a checkout, you know, uh, where, or any occupation where you're on your feet 24 seven, be a nurse, be a doctor. Um, but there's the, there are those private moments when it's just you and the work. And there is just something about doing that that, that feels so wonderful uh, that you come back to it again and again. And it's a very private thing. Uh, it's, you know, you do it on your own. There's no one looking over your shoulder. Uh, you know, and, and solitude is a part of it. You're in your own head. And you tell your story the best way you can. The other half of it, I mean, this this first bit is the only bit of the craft that you can control, which mm -hmm. is the work and the quality of the work. The other bits, the agents, the publishers, you have absolutely no control over any of that, whether it happens or not. I mean, all you can do is try to do the best, you know, create the best work that that you can. And that tends to be the work that, you know, moves you that's compelling as opposed to trying to figure out what the industry wants or or demands. I mean, I certainly kept plugging away. There were a couple of, you know, there, 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 there were two other manuscripts afterwards. Uh, again, still, they just weren't good enough. I, I have to be honest. I was still learning the craft, uh, particularly, I mean, I started just doing novels. I hadn't even attempted uh, short stories mm -hmm. then, but a novel is like it's like running a marathon. It 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 takes a while before you get a sense of you know your own craft, how to pace yourself, how to pace your story, um, and 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 all the other crucial elements that you need to have in there. Uh, but bit by bit, uh, doing a lot of reading, and by doing a lot of writing, bit by bit, I I finally. Uh, thank goodness, got to a stage where at least someone looked at my work and they said, okay, the, the, this is a guy that we can publish. And my first novel uh, was called The Hairdresser of Arare. Mm -hmm. And 
you know, I didn't get an agent for it. Uh, it came out from a small Zimbabwean press called uh, Weaver Press uh, and was simultaneously published in South Africa by Jakana Media at the time. Um, and that was sort of like, it, it, I was at the stage where I was like, oh, I'm just so happy that someone has said yes to my thing yeah. and, and, and they get what I'm doing. And I was working with an editor for the first time and I picked up a lot of things and I had the good fortune to, you know, have the novel published here by the now defunct Freight Books. Uh, that was a disaster. Um, but it was good while it lasted uh, by Ohio University Press in America. And then I had a few sort of like translations in German, Spanish, French, uh, and Italian. And so, yeah, I, it was a relief because I'd been plugging away for yeah. years, not knowing whether it would happen or not. Yeah. And and why do you think it it was that novel that that did get you that breakthrough? Was it? Do you think it took you that that sort of process to find your voice, as they say, to really find the story that you needed to tell? I think it did take me that long. Um, I think everything you say there is is correct, but I remember even the process of of, of writing it. Uh, it was Christmas two thousand and nine, and I just had this voice. Uh, mm. The main character is called Vimbai, and the story is about two hairdressers in in Harare and, and their rivalry. And I remember her voice was just so vivid. Um, and the first line, I knew there was something not quite right about Dumisani the very first time I ever saw him. That's her main rival in, in the book. And as soon as I got that, I, I went flat out. I did two weeks of writing nonstop. Um, and the story just, it just flowed. I was just mm -hmm. on. I, I, I was in a different zone. And I had the first draft that quick. And I thought, oh, wow. this is easier than I thought. You know, I, I, could, <laughs> I could sort of bang something out in two weeks, go off on holiday for the other 50 weeks of the year, and, and that's going to be me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that sounds like but quite a good one. It was a, it was a very successful. I actually find the Oh yeah, it, 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 it traveled quite quite a bit and and um I don't know what it was about the book. I mean just it, it resonated with with readers and, and that was like so heartwarming for me because you know it it's yeah, we write for ourselves. Um but one thing you quickly find out is no matter what your thing is, think of any hobby or any passion that you have, transporting whatever. There's enough people out there in the world uh, that are also into your thing. Um, it's, it's that whole paradox of, you know, what it is to be human, that we're all unique individuals. But because of that, we are pretty much exactly the same. And eventually, your tribe finds you as a writer. It, it, I think, um, which book was this? I, I read something in a book about how readers find books find their readers that it, it may be just one or two people it, mm. it, it may be a few million but eventually you know a book will find its readership mm -hmm. yeah and and when, when the book came out it, it was named by the observer as a uh, top 10 contemporary african book in 2012 it was nominated for the guardians not the booker prize award you know these are really great accolades to have to your to your name and when you when you were nominated or when you won these things did that make a difference at all going forward to, to how the book was marketed or how you felt about yourself as a writer? Well, it, it's, I think I only got the UK publisher because um, because of, of the Guardian thing. Uh, because before then, again, no one was interested. And, mm -hmm. and, and that's sort of like one of the crazy things about this that makes you like so neurotic. Um, and it was because of these things that eventually uh, it found an American publisher, etc. So, I mean, again, a lot of these things are outside of your control. Yeah. Um, you know, the, there can be people like raving about a book, but ultimately publishing as a business as well. I mean, you, you probably would have these multinational companies looking at it and saying, well, you know, are we going to make any money out of a book mm -hmm. about hairdressers in a small 
uh, from a small African country. It, it, it's business at the end of the day. But, um, you know, I did have good fortune with small presses and they took on my work and, you know, worked really hard to get it out there to, to the readership that, that wanted to read that sort of thing. Um, and I'm grateful for that. Do you think that actually that that can sometimes be an advantage of a small press that if they if they believe in a book they will push it towards and and they understand the market they will push it towards that market maybe a bit more than if you got a deal with a bigger publisher who's publishing you know hundreds of books a year that that might just get lost in the noise kind of a thing. I mean, I don't really know on that one. Um, mm -hmm. to be honest, uh, because now at this stage I am with a big publisher and I know sort of like the clout that can come with, mm -hmm. um, that the, the, they have the marketing budget, they have marketing departments, they, they, they have all these people that, you know, are passionate about your book that want to make it work. But with a small press, from my experience as well, they, they really like, um, passionate people running them, um. It's a very intimate relationship that that you have with, you know, the people working there, and and they do try their best uh, despite the the resource limitation. Mm -hmm. um, so it it could work either way, to be honest. Uh, but ultimately, to be fair, no one knows why books succeed yeah. or not. You know what I mean? It 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 is yeah. it's like a yeah, it, it it it's a game of roulette or something. Mm. You know, you you spin you spin the world and and you see where it lands. But it does help to have people kind of pushing and saying, "Well, we think this is good, and you should try this this book." Because unfortunately, like before I got published, I didn't know just how much work has to go in that in in mm -hmm. into that whole process of actually introducing the work to a readership. Yeah, I mean, even something as something we all say, oh, don't judge a book by its cover. That is so so important, and it's so so crucial mm -hmm. to have just the right cover that might appeal to to a reader. Yeah, I um, think that's right. Actually, you see that, funnily enough, with you know self published books and things like that the, the, on a on a Kindle or something. The, the book you're most likely to look at is the one that has a good sort of professional looking cover. Uh, whereas so many of them have pretty amateurish covers, so yeah, it does sort of show that that saying isn't quite isn't quite accurate, <laughs> at least in terms of initial interest. Um, you've you've also written a lot of um, short stories, I think, across genres, but also sci-fi stories. What you said at the start that you initially focused on novels rather than short stories, but what made you want to? try the short story form as well i think for me the short form was um i really got into it because the novel you know getting into a novel is quite a commitment um, mm -hmm. I, I know I, I i say you know the hairdresser only took me two weeks to to do the first draft my next book uh the maestro the magistrate and the mathematician took three years mm -hmm. um it, it is an all-consuming sort of like project and and you, you start getting all these ideas, but some of them, you know, have you ever had a really good idea, but you know, it's just not going to work as a novel. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And for me, that's where the, the short form came because I, I was also at the stage where even up till now, I'm trying to improve my craft. Um, but I'm also wanting to experiment with voice, with structure, with form, with all these other things that you can play around. And I found that the short story was a good sort of like R&D department where I could, you know, experiment on certain things that maybe I couldn't do um, in the long form. And strangely enough, that's sort of one of the reasons why I could also start playing around in different genres. Mm -hmm. So I could do my sci-fi, I could do lit tech, I could do crime. Um, but one of the strange things that results from this process of experimentation, for example, my next novel that's going to come out, which is like a fantasy novel, uh, The Library of the Dead, the main character there starts as a character that I 
published in Electric Spec, I think it was in 2014 or 2015, in right. a story called Ghost Stalker. And she had an amazing voice. She, she was just so dynamic. And a couple of years later, I did another story called The Library of the Dead that came out in a short story anthology. Um, and then I thought I could mash these up and have you know, a really interesting novel mm -hmm. with both these elements. So I find that I tend to cannibalize my own work and, and cannibalize for my own short fiction as well, if something really grabs me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and is the, it's a process of actually writing a short story. Is it similar in, in the way that you write your novels? You know, you know, do you do a lot of drafts? Do you tend to revise as you go? Do you plan a lot? Or do you just kind of write and see what happens? It depends on the story. It, 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 I really, I don't have one particular method. I, I, I try to suss out what works um, for each particular project that I'm doing. So, for example, with certain stories, you get an idea, but you're just not ready for it. You don't know enough about it and you make notes. And over time, things come to you. And then at some point, you're like, okay, I'm ready. Here's my notes. Here's what I'm trying to do. And you write it. Mm -hmm. Others are more spontaneous affairs. It just comes to you and you know it's on and you just write it. I mean, I, I've got uh, beta readers that I trust to look at my work after it's done and I and I redraft and I try to to polish things up. But it, it, it really depends on, you know, what you feel about that particular work and that in that particular moment in time. But it always helps whatever you create whether it's a short story or a novel to just let it lie for a bit yeah leave it come back to it with a fresh pair of eyes because whenever you get back into it you will see things that maybe two three weeks a month ago you you couldn't see and and you always find somewhere of fine tuning and refining mm -hmm. the thing into something a little bit better um but i should also add it's a lot of fun Doing this is so much fun. Mm. I, I absolutely love it. Yeah. I mean, I think I think that's why anyone that writes does it ultimately is that they enjoy it. I mean, for me, it's 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 you know, I I I want to find out what's happening in this story that I'm writing, even though I've got some sort of vague plan in my head. It's when you're actually writing it that you're discovering it yourself. So that is the enjoyment of it, I think. And you. Find your the first reader of your own work, aren't you? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, with those short stories, you you submit them, I think, to uh, different magazines and and things like that to to get published. Um, is that a process that that you think is useful for people that are wanting to start out? You know, is that a good place to start with with short stories or longer form? I would, you know definitely recommend starting in the short form mm -hmm. um, because believe it or not uh, if you are fortunate enough to get your work published certainly other writers read what's going on in those publications and agents I, I've had approaches from agents based on you know short stories mm -hmm. that I had out uh, which was a surprise. I mean, it, it doesn't always happen, but there are people who are interested in fiction that are looking at these things. But I think the best bit um, for a writer starting out is, you know, if, if you are working in short fiction and you are fortunate enough to to get a story accepted, is you get to work with an editor. Right, yeah. And that process you know, just having someone who professionally looks at at stories all the time go over your work and give you that little bit of of their opinion and and their perspective on it. It, it it's it's enlightening. Um, I mean, it can be a bit daunting, but you always have to go into this relationship um, with a charitable sort of like. Um, interpretation of their intentions i've, I've had writers in, including some of my friends who've had sort of like difficult relationships mm -hmm. um with editors that has never ever happened to me because i always i always assume that the person at the other end a they like the story because you know they bought it mm -hmm. but b you know they are trying to do right by you that that is always how i go into that sort of relationship um 
and over the years, I've also had the opportunity to, I mean, I recently um, edited a BAME version, uh, a BAME edition of Shoreline of Infinity, which is like Scotland's sci-fi magazine. Mm-hmm. And being at the other side of the desk, uh, you do realize that, yeah, I did edit a few stories. I was wrong about certain things, but that wasn't because I was an ass or, or mm-hmm. a dick or I was trying to do the right <laughs> round. It was just me trying to get the story uh, to come out in the best possible version. And it's a give and take sort of relationship. Um, but yeah, doing that, you, you do learn that um, certainly the way I see it, that you're sort of like an artist when you're doing your own thing and you're drafting your work. After that, when you're dealing with other people in the industry, you've really got to be professional yeah. about it. You, you, you know, the, that's sort of like the business end of, this thing that you do and you absolutely have to be professional because you know people work hard you know and i mean especially if we're looking at literary magazines a lot of these editors don't even get paid for the work that they do Mm -hmm. um but you've at least got to approach them with a degree of of humility and respect and, and an appreciation that they are sort of like contributing to the art form and maybe you can gain something from those interactions. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that, uh, that would be my advice. Uh, when you get advice for, you know, when you get notes from editors and stuff that what is the best approach? Is it like when you've finished writing your novel, is it best to sort of take a bit of time and, and let the, let the mm-hmm. notes sit in your head so that you can work out if you agree or disagree. And what happens when, you know, you do get a note that you're like, well, I just don't think that that's going to work for this story. How easy is it to manage that sort of thing? Yeah, I, I mean, by the time you send it and, and, and they've accepted it, in your own head, and, and writers are creatures of ego, it's the greatest thing ever written. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, and 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 so to get that feedback at the end, that's like, look, we have to work on this thing to get it better. It 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 can sort of like maybe bring you down a notch, you know, mm-hmm. back to reality. But I find, read it, leave it. Um, depending on your editing schedule, for a couple of days, a few weeks if possible, and come back with it from a fresh perspective. Now, that process is again. This is where a certain element of professionalism has to come in you have to be an honest uh critic of your own work and a lot of the times because the editor is sort of like the reader's champion they are pointing out things that readers at the other end might not get or they might not see and they are pointing out at certain things that could be seen as weaknesses in your own work um now it's a give and take process you don't have to take everything you Mm -hmm. have to say um but i found in my again in my experience that a lot of the time they are right about certain things that they will point to to elements that 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 you've missed the bits that you don't agree about and this will always happen there will be things that because editors are human beings as well and if if you have a story out and if you get three or four people to read it, you'll get three or four different opinions of what that actual story is. And so this is like their opinion of the thing. Mm-hmm. And there are certain elements that they might miss. There are certain elements that they might not see because they come in with their range of experience and you might have given them something they haven't encountered before. Mm-hmm. I'll be very honest. Uh, when I was editing in Shoreline of Infinity, um, I edited... Zencho's marvelous story, Odette. Uh, it's just an exquisite piece of writing. She is a fantastic, I mean, she's a phenomenal writer anyway. And we were lucky to have that story. But one of the things I went in and did was like, I sorted out sort of like some grammatical errors and, and uh, that I thought I'd seen in, in the dialogue. And then she came back to me and she said, uh, look, I've seen what you've done, but you've gone out and ironed out all the elements of Malaysian English into sort of like a standardized form of English. Mm -hmm. Now, I haven't had too many encounters with Malaysian English. Mm. Now, if it was a less professional writer, they might have found it offensive. Yeah. 
that I've gone and, and done that, right? Uh, but she understood that, again, I was trying to do right by her. I was trying to improve the story. And this is something that I didn't get. But once she told me, um, we could then work on it. And it's fine. It's not a big deal. What it also, I mean, so when you're working with an editor and you don't agree on something, what you should also be prepared to do is to justify the creative decisions you make. Yeah. And this also helps you in a certain way that, I mean, a novel is a long thing, but every sentence in there, every single word has to justify its existence. You have to know why it's in there. Otherwise, it has no business in, it, yeah. it has no business being in the piece. Mm -hmm. And and this is all it is. You, you've got to explain this is what we're trying to do. And does does it work? Sometimes you even discover as you're trying to explain what it is you're doing, you even discover that, oh, shit, this doesn't yeah. work. Yeah. Um, and that's happened to me on several occasions. Um, you just have to be professional about it. There is no no other way. Otherwise, this game isn't for you. And, and I suppose it's that, it's that kind of you know give and take because, as we've said, you know, why, why does someone become a writer? Because they love to tell stories. and But, but they also want those stories to be read by people. And, you know, you, I don't think it's probably quite rare that someone becomes a writer and goes to the trouble of trying to find an agent or get it into a publisher book of some sort because you don't <clears> want anyone to read it. And I think you have to have that understanding of, mm -hmm. as you say, when you when you pass it over to, to, to someone else, they're the people who know what sells, what's the best way, the best form for it to be in to reach the maximum people. And ultimately, that's kind of what we all want. We all want our work to be read by as many folk as possible. And I think you have to appreciate that the way you've written it might not be the best form for that. There might be some changes, and and it is about under, uh, taking that on board, and not seeing it as a as 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 an attack on your style of writing or whatever. And to be honest, um, there is this feeling that you get after you know you've been through your edits, and you go over your work, and it's sharper, and it's more yeah. polished, and it mm -hmm. sometimes it almost feels like someone else wrote it like a more <laughs> yeah. competent version of you wrote that <laughs> thing because it's it's got a certain sophistication and polish to it and 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 it's always sort of like um you know th that's a great feeling there is no substitute for that but you have to be willing to to do the work mm -hmm. it's that simple I, I, i'm always uh, we we had uh, craig robertson the scottish crime writer on the podcast um a while ago and he told a story about uh, Lee Child getting notes and he always, and apparently Lee Child always gets his notes and there's like maybe, I don't know, 25 notes and he thinks, oh, this is all rubbish initially. And then <clears throat> after a week, he'll come back and say, well, maybe those five are okay. And he'll make those changes and then he'll come back a week later and go, well, maybe they've got a point about those next five. <laughs> and by the end, it's it, all of the points have been have been ironed out and agreed. So I think that maybe is the way to approach it. Um, well, and Lee, Lee Child has done all right, apparently. Yeah, I think so. so. He's, <laughs> he's not that bad. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I, I wanted to ask about the, you know, the, the two books that you've had out so far, and we will talk about your, about your new book shortly, but, but the two books that you've had out so far are, um, they feel like they're, they're important stories, that they're, they're telling a message about um, you know, either space in Zimbabwe or... Uh, your second book is about characters from Zimbabwe who live in Edinburgh, and um, and I, and I wondered if if you've noticed a change in in to modern times now, and and whether African fiction is an area we're starting to see people take more of an interest in. You know, you've you've got films like uh, Black Panther, District Nine, uh, books like the Rosewater trilogy. That it's sort of it's a more of an interest now in, in that in that sort of story than there was maybe five ten years ago. I would. I have to agree with that. Um, I mean, there have always been sort of like African writers floating about, but, you know, it was one or two. I mean, there was a time, for example, like uh, with my second book, I won't name the publisher, uh, <laughs> but we submitted it to them. And the feedback that I got was, uh, yeah, this this book is great. Uh, it's, it's very well written. It's, it's beautiful in parts, but We've already got one other African writer, so we can't publish oh, it. Of course. <laughs> I mean, w w w what do you do with that? Uh, <laughs> you, 
you, you know, because if, if you can take a rejection where it's like, you know, it's got something to do with the literary yeah. merit or for artistic reasons. But if, if someone just says, well, you know, we've got another African and we, we only ever publish one African at a time. <laughs> 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 yes. Exactly. So it, it, it's crazy. I mean, but publishing is a business at the end of the day. And, and those are sort of like uh, harsh realities. But over the years, particularly sort of like with contemporary African fiction, I think that it's gone to a stage where sort of like there is a realization, I, I suppose, here in the West that these works are commercially viable mm-hmm. and, and that publishers can take a punt on them. And, and this is because there's a whole raft of African writers that have done particularly well. And, and it's that, it, it is that simple because at the end of the day, publishers are businesses. I mean, there's also been a lot of work that's been done sort of like uh, just through activism saying, you know, mm-hmm. the, the, this whole attitude and stuff, it's bullshit, you know, it, because it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. If you don't give people a chance and you don't publish their work and no one's buying it, you can then turn around and say, well, no, no one buys it, yeah, but they exactly. never get the opportunity to buy yeah, it anyway. Yeah, absolutely. You know, you've got to put it out there first. And, mm-hmm. and, and, but readers are sophisticated. I, I told you, I, I was interested in 19th century Russian literature yeah. in my twenties. I mean, none of that shit was written for me. Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah. Dostoevsky was, you know, he, he didn't even, Zimbabwe didn't even exist at the time yeah. um, as a modern state. So readers do get it. I mean, readers are more adventurous than I think the industry imagines them to be. Uh, and I, I, for one, I certainly enjoy reading books from all over the world. Uh, but it's just you have to put those books in front of me because when I walk into a bookstore, my selection is only going to be the things that are available in front of me. Yeah. Um, but yeah, this is, I mean, this is certainly a, a better time than it was, say, 10, 15 years ago to, to be an African writer. Uh, and hopefully those conditions keep improving. Uh, but again, for me as an artist, I am well aware of the fact that this side of things, uh, about how the industry functions, that is out of my control. Yeah. You know, all, all the biases that might be there and, and, and the stupid preconceived notions. I have no control over any of that. All I can do, all I can work on is my craft and to create the best uh, work that I possibly can. Um, and I'm certainly fortunate, uh, or I have been fortunate to see that even with, you know, small publishers who are more likely to take a punt on you that you know i have been able to to reach an audience and and that's fine that that you know ultimately at the end of of the day that's all you can do really Mm -hmm. um yeah absolutely and and the new book the library of the dead you've spoken about it a bit but i think it's is it the first novel of a series is that is that right is that the theme (laughs) It is. It's about a young girl called Ropa who's out of school. Um, she's nearly 15 and she earns a living talking to ghosts. She's kind of like a, a royal mail service. She gets messages from the dead, passes them on to the living for money. Mm-hmm. Um, but one of her ghostly clients uh, tells her about kids going missing in Edinburgh and it's on her patch. So she puts a Sherlock hat on. And she goes investigating. So, you know, it's got villainous villains, things that go bump in the night. Excellent. Um, and you kind of discover that sort of like this touristy Edinburgh, uh, or at least what the city tries to present itself as to the outside world, isn't quite, you know, what's going on underneath the surface. Um, it, was, it was a fun, fun book to write. And uh, did you pitch it as, you know, a series of books um, or did you pitch it as a standalone with a possibility of a follow-up? 
Oh, I I pitched it as as a series. I I sort of like after I finished writing it, I signed on with Jamie Cohen at the Ambassador Agency, uh, who was like really really passionate about the book, um, and it and saw its potential immediately. Mm-hmm. Um, and sort of like we pitched it as a series, uh, and and Tor who bought the book. Uh, um, you know, we've got a two book deal with them. Um, and so even now I've, I've just gone through a round of edits and I'm also prepping to get into sort of like book two, which I hope to complete uh, by early next year. Yeah. Thanks. Really? Uh, it, it, it's, a very di- it's a very different thing from what I've done before, which is sort of like doing standalone books. But, you know, I'm thrilled about sort of like the potential of doing something maybe a little bit wider, you know, it, it, it's, you know, a little more extensive. Uh, I have, you know, I'm, I'm relishing the opportunity to go back into that same world and flesh it out over and over and, and, and play a long game as opposed to just having everything out in, in one. I, I always wonder about that because, you know, it's, it's like, how much do you keep back when you, when you're, when you're telling a story like that, um, obviously you've got a two book deal so you know there is going to be a second book but when you're when you're wanting to tell a story and you've got this idea in your head that there might be an overall arc over a number of books how much it must be quite difficult i think to say right this is the only part of the story that i'm telling just now and and i'll tell the rest later when you don't know necessarily whether whether the rest will ever ever appear yeah, we live in faith, don't we? Yeah, um, absolutely. You hope it's going to happen. But I think as you're doing it, like when you set off, uh, you've sort of, in my case, I've got an idea of where this thing is going, like in broad strokes. And I'm sort of filling in, you know, the, the different beats of, of, of the whole series. But what also happens is sometimes you get unexpected things happening. And you have to do these adjustments to the entire series mm-hmm. as a whole. So you drag some things back and certain things you have to punt into the future. It, it's, I guess it's like juggling in a sense. You're throwing things up and you have to catch certain things, certain balls at certain times. Mm-hmm. And you have to lob certain balls up at a, to a certain height and hope you can catch them later on. It's, it's, it's a strange, strange process. Um, yeah, it, it it is terrifying to think that you might not be able to um to tell the full story because that, I mean that's always a, a possibility if, if readers don't get into it. Uh, but you can't worry about that because mm-hmm. all you can do is sort of like give them the best version possible and and tell the story how it's meant to be told. Um, otherwise, you're just gonna blow your load quickly uh, and run out of. Is it railroad? Is that yeah, the expression? Yeah, uh-huh, or yeah, runway? Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and, and you're not going to take off. Uh, so it, it's all about pacing yourself. I just look at it as, as a marathon. Um, running's my thing at the moment. Uh, I, I, I took it up sort of like last year and I'm crazy about it. And, and, and I always go back to a running metaphor that, <laughs> you know, if, if you're doing, if you're doing a sprint, then you just go all out, right? Mm. Do your hundred meters and you're done. But, with the marathon you you've kind of really got to pace yourself and you know get a sense of you know how much you're going to give at any particular moment in time knowing full well that you still have you know after you've done that first mile you still got another 25 to go so you can't just you know you can't just do it as as, as a sprinter would yeah Yeah. absolutely Um, and and will you will you try and make the books stand alone you know if, 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 for instance, all the, all you ever did was the two books, is it important that every book in 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 the, in the series, you know, is a is, is is enough of an ending if somebody was to stop there, or do you is it important to always keep the seeds planted and end on the cliffhanger for the for the next book? How much resolution do you do you bring in the end of the book? I'm sort of planting seeds. I mean, you will be able to 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 read the books to a certain extent as standalone works but it, it is particularly important for me that you know i want you to read sort of like all five of the 
novels that we've got planned now so that you get the full story. Mm-hmm. Um, but so it, it's not exact because I've read certain series where it really doesn't matter at what point you start. Mm-hmm. Um, but I want you to go through them sequentially because that is exactly how I've planned it. And so, you know, it's like dominoes falling. Um, I want to tantalize the reader. There, 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 there has to be something in them. I, I want them to think, you know, at the end of the first book, damn, that was a great ride. Uh, I would like to get on again and, and, and yeah. see where we go. Um, yeah. And at the moment, we're asking all the podcast guests because we can't avoid it because it's everywhere. But I mean, what what has the impact of, um, you know, lockdown, coronavirus been on your writing? And do you think it will affect the stories that you tell going forward? I mean, let me just say for a start that, you know, the the coronavirus, uh, you know, it's been devastating. And, and people have lost loved ones um and 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 that's sort of like the most distressing thing about it mm-hmm. um especially i mean early on we were all in a bit of a panic about what was going on was it the apocalypse was it something else and and for those who lost loved ones you know my, my sincerest condolences and and it's, it's it's a horrible horrible thing um as to sort of like being affected as a writer, I mean, thank goodness I'm not sort of like one of the frontline staff mm-hmm. uh, in the NHS or working in healthcare and, and, and in, in social care and nursing homes that are having to deal and, and bear the brunt of, of, of this thing um, or sort of like the essential workers that are pulling chips to keep things going. Um, but for me as a writer, ironically, um, this has been a great, great time to be working because sort of like everything slowed down. They, they, they sort of like a certain pace of life that, mm. that you have when um, society is functioning as normal. And, and now uh, you're being told to stay indoors as long as you can only put, nip out to the shops or for a bit of exercise. Uh, and those, are, those conditions are ideal for writing you know because <laughs> gone are the people that you know the, the the social engagements that that take time out of your work uh the people that you need to meet etc cetera, etc cetera. and and you are sort of like really dealing with with the work at end so I've, I've been very productive i've i've had uh you know i've got quite a bit of work done during this period but um you know i'm comfortable and used to solitude uh and it works for me to to a certain extent and and this whole period for me uh it was just stepping back from the usual hectic lifestyle that i that i have and just being able to focus on this thing and hopefully stay sane at the same time so paradoxically i i think um for any writer not for any writer for myself uh this period has been you know, really ideal. Um, and there's certain things that have happened as well. You know, I've, in the times I've gone out for exercise, running through Edinburgh, which is the city that I write about, I've been able to go to places in the city that I would normally avoid because of, of the traffic. Yeah. So I've been able to pop my nose in different areas. Um, mm-hmm. And it's been dead. And, and, and you sort of get a different perspective of the city because there isn't that bustling thing going on. And, and those are... There are already certain elements of of you know the things that I've seen that will feed into my work. I mean, I'm not going to write about the pandemic mm-hmm. itself. Um, I still think it's it's too soon, man. Mm-hmm. Um, this thing, but we only kind of really understand what it is we've been through. Maybe in twenty, thirty years' time, you you've got to let it settle. I I, I know, you know, certain authors feel differently, and they're like. You know, I'm ready. I'm writing about this thing, and 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 that's fine. It's it's just a matter of of perspective. There is no right or wrong way of doing this thing, mm-hmm. um, but it is, you know, uh, it is a very sort of like unique set of circumstances, and and a bit strange when the things that we take for granted, uh, 
really come undone. Uh, you know, you meet people that you normally see often, and and you can't even get close to them. You mm. you, you know, and you're like, whoa, what is going on? Um, but I mean, if I think in terms of the Library of the Dead, which I'm working on, uh, the Edinburgh depicted in there already has a slight sort of like post-apocalyptic dimension to it. Uh, and I can say in terms of, of the apocalypse, uh, this is, is it's pretty mild compared to the depictions that we've had yeah. from, you know, from sci-fi in the past. Yeah. yeah. What was the last TV show that, that you watched or are watching at the moment? Plus TV show that I watched. Oh God, I've watched quite a few. How, how can I not even remember the last <laughs> show that I watched? It's like Bubble Gub, right? You watch so much stuff on Netflix, yeah. you can't even remember what it is you watched. I know what I really enjoyed was this Korean zombie series, uh, Kingdom. Right. Oh yeah, but that's I'm not, not the that, last. Yeah. yeah, it is outstanding. Um, that's not the last thing I watched. This is disgraceful. Can I just put a plug in for Kingdom that, on that, Netflix? That's fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, totally just, right? Kingdom's good. Yeah, that's fine. I've heard good things about it. I've not watched it. It's on the list to watch at some point. Yeah. Uh, what was the last book you read? The last book I read. Um, is I'm um, I'm reading an arc of Jennifer Makumbi's The First Woman. She's this amazing Ugandan writer who wrote this extraordinary first novel called Kintu. Um, and they've said she's doing for Ugandan literature what uh, Chiuna Achebe did for Nigerian literature. I mean, she is just a phenomenal writer. She draws these like really three-dimensional amazing characters but you know she she's able to tell you these stories about ugandan life and ugandan character mm -hmm. in like really you know in, in, in really interesting and, and nuanced ways she's a fantastic fantastic author and i have enjoyed it immensely i mean the first woman itself is is overtly a feminist work but it's it's not sort of like your uh western type feminism what she's sort of showing you is that there is an african type of feminism that may not subscribe to like the same ethos mm. uh, and, and the same ideas as um western feminism but they are these strong sort of like ugandan women with their own agency that are navigating their society in like really interesting and meaningful ways i uh, it's coming out in October this year, and I highly recommend it. Excellent. It is interesting because that's you know you get you get authors who are obviously from the area that they're writing about, and they they, they talk about it in an authentic voice that you know we've we've seen, for instance, um, Alexander McCall Smith is a very successful series of books set set in Africa, but he's not African; he's a white man from Scotland. You know, is 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 his is that viewpoint authentic? Is it is that helpful or hurtful to the whole kind of African literature scene? Well, the way I sort of say it, I, I mean, I, I think every sort of like author should write whatever they, they want to write. Um, but you have to have an acknowledgement that um, white people aren't particularly good at writing, quote unquote, the other minority characters, right? Uh, because they, they're never forced to see the world from that particular perspective. Let me give you an example of what happens. Um, if you are writing a book, right, about, say, we're all guys here. Marco, you're a man. Uh, Tarek, so, so are you, um, I'm assuming. Um, but if you want to write about a female character, now one thing you might do uh, is you might default to all your stereotypes. You say, I'm writing a woman. And then you don't see the character in front of you what are they like as a person? What music are they into? You know, what is their temperament? What are their hopes and dreams? And you just say, I'm writing. Well, you are going to write a cardboard mm -hmm. character, yeah. a cardboard cutout of what you, you know, stereotypically think women are. You can't write woman. 
Yeah. Uh, the best novels are about really individuated characters. Um, and and so what I find in in sort of like this depictions of quote unquote minority characters from a number of white writers is simply they're not even trying to depict the person. They just go, okay, this is a black person or this is a Muslim, and then they just throw all the shit they've seen on TV and they don't even attempt to write an actual fully fleshed out um human being. Mm-hmm. And and that's the problem that you get there. Um I certainly wouldn't begrudge McCall Smith uh his success uh, for doing it. I mean, if there's enough people that want to read that sort of thing, you know, that that's up to them. I think the problem arises where you have this obscene sort of like situation where people from those other actual places that write authentic nuanced stories about where they're from and what's going on there are not given a shot. And then all these guys that are writing, you know, whatever it is they're given, they get given all the stuff. And everyone's like, well, how exactly does mm-hmm. this work? Yeah, um, yeah. And I think that's that, that's where the problem lies. Uh, because, I mean, how many Botswanian female authors are available in your local bookshop? Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the, yeah. probably the only book that you might get in there is by Alexander McCall Smith. But that doesn't mean they aren't you know, writers working in Botswana. It, it's maybe they're just not getting those same opportunities. So I should say, when we talk about these things, no one's asking for a handout. You know, no one's asking for, you know, something they didn't earn. But surely the playing field has to be level. Yeah. yeah. Um, it, it, it cannot be the case that all these places, uh, the only good writers are sort of like your white male writers. That's bullshit. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it's just that the other people might send in their work and, and they might not get in, you know, they, they might not even get a look in, as it were. Um, yeah. It's a lack, so of, a lack of opportunity. Like, the opportunity isn't the same. They're not given the yeah. same opportunities. It, Exactly. And, and, and I've had sort of like all these kind of like, uh, you know, horror stories from my own peers about sort of like some of the res- responses that they get about their own work. It, it, it's crazy, but hopefully, slowly, gradually, things are changing. Um, yeah. Awesome. Um, and then the very last question is... Uh, the last this may pose the same problem as the tv show what was the last <laughs> what was the last movie you saw the last movie i saw was on netflix which is like uh the first sort of like zimbabwean series on there not series movie on there which is called cook off and and it's this really cute sweet um rom-com about a young lady who's like a chef. It's it's like a master chef kind of thing right, as yeah. reality mm-hmm. of like TV show. Uh and her navigating her way through that and finding love in the process. It was done on like a really low budget. Um I think something like thirty thousand dollars or something wow. like that. Okay. It's not lower. So it's it's really low budget, but it's sweet, it's heartwarming it's moving and I fell in love with every single character in there. Um, oh, cool. So yeah, that's Excellent. that one. I remember. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Getting some good recommendations here. And uh, the very, very last thing is a super quick fire. One or the other. So just the first one that pops into your head. Uh, and we'll start with star Wars or star Trek. Star Trek. Correct. Answer. <laughs> uh, TV <laughs> or cinema. TV. Uh, eat in or eat out? Eat out. And the last one that always gets Tarek angry. Uh, <laughs> real book or e-book? Real book every time. Oh, no. <laughs> you were doing so well and you've blown it in the last minute. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you, you've got to be able to feel it, to touch it. Exactly. To... <laughs> Sniff it, to throw it away. If it These weird people who sniff books, I will never understand. <laughs> a bunch of weirdos, a lot of them. <laughs> they used to call us bibliophiles once upon a time. <laughs> <laughs>
I really enjoyed that chat with Tendai. That was some really interesting stuff. Yeah, no, it was. I mean, like we were saying at the at the start of the podcast, it, it is interesting hearing, you know, firsthand about the the lack of opportunities that yeah. the um, African writers have had. You know, that story of the 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 publishing house that liked his book but wouldn't take him on because they already had an African writer. It's like, I mean, it's 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 like a you know a parody of what of what of a kind of cliche example mm-hmm. of, of of what you know what you like to think doesn't really happen, but obviously it still goes on mm-hmm. uh, and still a massive barrier to a lot of people trying to get into the industry. Mm-hmm. Uh, no, and, and 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 the points about you know McCall Smith and as we said at the start, very famous people writing very successful books mm-hmm. set in Africa, and there is a debate to be had. I think about you know should these should these voices that were are being heard that are telling these types of stories be from people who are authentically from that area who well, have lived the experience i mean my own view is that i kind of i agree with tendai if if, if michael smith or anyone wants to write about that topic then i think that's absolutely fine and if people were to buy it that's absolutely fine but it shouldn't mean that it shouldn't be at the expense of absolutely um authentic african voices telling a story as well yeah. you know yeah um, i mean how many books are set in america or yeah. britain you know there's there's space for mm-hmm. all 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 writers from mm-hmm. all walks of life telling stories set in all parts of the world and absolutely there shouldn't, shouldn't be a you know having one one african book on the on the yearly release shouldn't stop another one coming up no sure. definitely not uh, yeah it's, it's all about opening up the opportunities which it sounds like it is slowly opening up yeah and... I, I, you'd like to think we're, we're making progress for sure yeah hopefully hopefully and i did like the sound of uh, the library of the dead um yeah absolutely. It, it sounds like it could be a good series especially for us being set in edinburgh as well that's always yeah, a bonus that's always a nice draw isn't it when any film any film fast and furious Eurovision set in Edinburgh. I will watch it. Exactly. Yeah, <laughs> I've not watched the Eurovision film yet. No, I'm not just... <laughs> Some uh, weekend viewing, perhaps. Yeah. But uh, thanks very much, Tendai, for for coming on the podcast. We really appreciate that. Um, uh, and uh, if you've not read his books, I would definitely recommend grabbing those. Yeah, um, next week we've got another great guest on the podcast, Adam Christopher, who has actually just announced on Twitter that he's writing uh, a book about the mandalorian the star oh, trek it's oh, the, the star that's, trek that's, oh my goodness <laughs> the star wars uh, character in tv series this is this is surprising news mark i don't, I don't remember him mentioning that <laughs> no it's, it's almost like he was under some sort of embargo when he spoke to us <laughs> the empire but, was very strict <laughs> yes but he he uh he's written a lot of uh, sort of franchise tie-in novels and a lot of original novels uh, the real electromatic series sort of it's a really cool genre mashup of sort of sci-fi and mm-hmm. noir stories, um, and he's also written sort of harder sci-fi type stuff as well. Um, but it was a really good chat we had with him, and again another interesting route into publishing uh, that yeah. we heard from him as well. Yeah. Um, a very a very different uh, sort of writer, you know, a lot of very fast fast deadlines, weeks sometimes mm-hmm. to get a whole book written. So it's a it's a very different type of writing to. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the, t- the tie-in tend stuff. Yeah, yeah, the tie-in yeah. stuff exactly. Uh-huh. Yeah. Well, I hope you enjoyed that episode. If you did, please leave a comment down below, hit that thumbs up button, and be sure to hit that subscribe button as well, so you never miss an episode like these ones below. And if you want to get in touch, you can always drop us a tweet in the Twitter machine, which is at UK Page One, as evidenced here, and our other social media channels are available. Otherwise, we hope to see you next episode. See you later. Mm-hmm.